truly my great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Paul. As we all know, Peter is no doubt one of the superstars in our department. His research is strongly motivated by real world problems and has profound impact. So he has made significant contributions in infectious disease, uh, kidney donation, and uh, um, what else? the uh, environmental health, and among all many uh, different domain areas. And during COVID, as you probably have known, his team has made tremendous, uh, tremendous contributions in forecasting and the monitoring the outbreaks of COVID, and also including monitoring the uh, wastewater in and off our campus, so which keep us safe. So he's truly a hero to every one of us. And on a separate note, his team has won recently won the 2022 uh, the Best Paper Award in the Journal of uh, Statistics in Biosciences. If you don't know, it's the best paper in the entire journal for the entire year. So it's truly an amazing achievement. And he's um, so he's also the uh, elected member of the ISI and also the fellow of ASA and uh, IMS, which speaks volume for his contribution to the mathematical statistics uh, uh, in, the, in the discipline. So his research is so significant, has so many uh, achievements. Even the president of the United States and senators sent him emails, right, Peter? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 So Peter is also a great mentor. He has trained 22 students, uh, doctoral students, and six postdocs. So he is also on my lunch committee. So I had the honor to receive his mentorship as, as well. As far as I can tell, he's super generous with his knowledge and always happy to share what his thoughts and perspectives and his experiences on almost everything. So I've learned a lot from him. And he truly cares for his students. When they're now tracking codes and fancy models, he would take his students to hiking, to lunch, to all kinds of activities. So his students are very lucky to be in his team and they are all proud to be in, in his team. So no wonder he's one of the most popular advisors in the department. And you may wonder with all these uh, research, teaching activities, and also admin activities, does Peter still have time for the work-life balance? Mm -hmm. Well, as far as I, I can tell, Peter is a man with a wide variety, uh, variety of interests. He's a badminton enthusiastic, and he's a world traveler. And uh, you may or may not know, he's also a hot dog lover. So I saw a lot of uh, good, good pictures in his, uh, uh, in his uh, social network. So without further ado, I will give the stage to our beloved Peter. So, Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much to Brahman and Game for such a nice introduction and departmental invitation to uh, deliver a journal talk in the department. Sincere thanks uh, to all of you who are visibly here uh, to attend my talk. I appreciate your effort and support. Also thank all of you um, who assigned the Zoom link to attend the talk. Your time is highly appreciated. So I rarely uh, prepare uh, scripts for my presentation, but this one is an uh, exception um, as it involves a lot of details um, on my uh, sort of career up to this point. And so I uh, hope that I can give a presentation with you know, good uh, sort of uh, uh, precision and uh, it, it, it's appropriate uh, present presentation. So um, I, I was a little bit hesitant to accept this invitation. And actually, this is the third time <laughs> I agreed to give this talk. Although my age and stage of career seems to uh, suggest that it's my turn to uh, do such a talk. And uh, in my humble opinion, that, that my personal journey has been very boring uh, and may not provide very good tips to uh, young generations 
for their career choices. Well, on the other hand, I thought that um, uh, this year is my 40th year uh, of my journey uh, since I entered the field of statistics as an undergraduate student. I went to college in 1981 for my uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, so this is my 40th year. I heard this term like statistics. So I do believe that my journey is kind of unique, carries many um, memorable uh, moments, um, either professionally or personally. Um, so there are a lot of things to, to share. And um, I think we are all writing the book of our life. And these uh, many chapters that are sometimes and um, but overall, uh, you know, our journey seems to have a, a lot of uh, enjoyment and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, interesting moments uh, that I like to uh, talk a little bit. Hopefully, like my journey is going to be a fun that to, to, you know, not waste your time today. Yeah. <clears throat> so when I'm writing my script and preparing my presentation, um, this gave me an opportunity to uh, rewind my life and dig out retrospectively some alternative points that impact my career trajectory. More importantly, I, uh, when I tried to understand why I made the choice A versus choice B, I was able to see influences from my parents, my family members, my teachers, my colleagues, my collaborators, my students, my friends, um, they all have given me positive impact to my career and in general on my life. The more I think about my journey, the more uh, gratitude my heart feels towards those people who uh, occurred in my uh, in the different stages of my journey. I cannot thank more um, to them about their love, influence, help, and accompany in my life. That's why I. Uh, give the title of my talk, A Journey with Abundance Positive Corporates. So, I mean, to begin my talk, I'd like to share a little bit some my uh, family background. Um, so, um, I was born in 1964, and um, I, I spent most of the time um, uh, uh, in, in my uh, mother's uh, parents' house uh, in Shanghai. Actually, I was born in November in Shanghai, and I actually received genes from a engineer, my father, and a medical doctor, uh, my mother. As you can see over my talk today, uh, their gene fought hard to be more experienced over my journey. And eventually it seems that my mother's team uh, actually won. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and then, at that time, um, uh, my parents actually lived in a different city called Chengdu. And basically, that's the sort of the head part of Yangtze River. Yangtze River is the longest river in China, and Chengdu is in the top of the Yangtze River, and Shanghai actually is the tail of the Yangtze River. So, these two cities are roughly like 1,500 miles apart. It, you know, it takes about three and a half hours by flight, right? So, and my parents worked for a railway, uh, railway company located in Chengdu. Chengdu actually is the capital city of a province called Sichuan. If you know Hafu, the panda bears, that's the place that <laughs> the this, this is sort of the signature of the province. Um, actually, this company they work is the uh, headquarter of managing operation, maintenance, and logistic of the all the real lines in three provinces, like Sichuan, Yunnan, and the Guizhou. So it's, it's the head of it's the headquarter of the company, but the company managed the real lines, you know, in three provinces. So uh, they, they were very busy when we were little. So, so for most of my uh, childhood, from birth to age six, I lived in Shanghai with my grandparents who used to uh, own a vegetable garden, a vegetable farm in the suburb of Shanghai uh, that they retired during my time with them. Uh, my parents' house was torn down in early 1970s to build a high-rise 
permit as part of the city uh, expansion Shanghai. Um, so, so now actually the location of my uh, grandparents' old house was uh, actually in the interior of the city center. So uh, I spent most of my uh, like first six years or so with my grandparents in Shanghai and I had a lot of fun there. And um, so I was, a, a, I, I'm the second child of the family. And I have two siblings and two, two sisters. Um, so these photos were taken when we were almost young. And so, so I want to talk a little bit about my Chinese name because everybody knows my English name, Peter, uh, that was given by an English teacher, but I do have a Chinese name. <laughs> You know, it's just Xun Kun. I mean, it's very hard for people to pronounce my first name Xu. But uh, you know, so so this this is a, a Chinese name con consists of two characters. The first one is Xu, like its read, reading form is like this. Um, it means like learning and scholar. So every family, I mean, traditionally, some of you know, like my family, we have something called a generation name specific to a family. So each family has a system of generation names. So in my family, this uh, system is defined by a form, like 20 characters. So each generation has its particular character. Could be the second one, could be third one. In my generation, we use Xu as the, the second one. So Kuan actually is the, uh, the actually name given by my parent. Um, so um, it's, it's it's actually the one of this Yao, so in Bakwa, right? So this is earliest forecast model created by Fushi about 8,000 years ago. It has three, eight elements. This is yin, yang, yin and yang system, right? It's a binary system that was created by some, you know, the ancient time in China. They created the system with basically eight elements. And the Kun is uh, the one of those you know, up, uh, eight elements. Another one is uh, Tian, which is the sky, and Quinn means land or soil. So sky and soil will be the two most important elements in the in nature, and other things are in between. So you have other six elements are sort of between land and sky. So that's basically the forecasting system created about 8,000 years ago by, uh, you know, Fushi. And they want to forecast the weather essentially. And um, the reason they choose this name is the uh, the right part of this uh, character, like this, is pronounced as Sen. So Sen actually is the nickname of Shanghai. And um, so this is uh, uh, is actually is, is my birthplace, right? So actually saying is uh, the family name of first mayor of Shanghai about 2000 years ago. So, so I mean, Shanghai has other nicknames, but Sheng is uh, one of those nicknames, like Big Apple for New York. So Sheng is the nickname of Shanghai and named after the first mayor of this city. So about my elementary school, and I, it took me about five and a half years to uh, in elementary school, okay. So I returned to Chengdu when I was six years old. I began my grade one in elementary school in spring uh, 1972, with a delay from September 1971. Uh, it was in the midst of the Cultural Revolution uh, in China, uh, logistic operations in school were okay, but Curriculum was not very rigorous. Um, I finished my elementary school in 1976, which was the year of a turning point in China. This is the year when Chairman Mao died and China began the new era that Deng Xiaoping and his alliance uh, took power. During the five years of six years of my elementary school, almost all exams are open book exams. And, uh, there were no after school programs like the gener younger generation of you know, here Chinese students, they, they all have this math Olympia 
And after you know the school training camps, and I did not have any of them. We just have fun after school. <laughs> we have all open exams in the school in elementary school. I mean, for a child, that was a, probably a dream school. <laughs> but I did learn some uh, something during my this period of time. I learned music. Um, so at the grade three, I began to learn violin and the earth. So probably have never taught this kind of instrument, which is like two string. Um, so uh, instrument uh, is a traditional sort of uh, Chinese uh, instrument. So uh, it unfortunately, it turned out that I do not have any good music genes and talents. <laughs> and, and but nevertheless, I began my so lifetime interest or hobby in classical music. Um, so uh, also requested by my father, he gave me like homework, uh, but uh, I need to practice a uh, like a uh, paragraph as our daily homework. So I do a lot of writing, like uh, brush, uh, brush uh, calligraph. Uh, and also I read a lot of books. My father's mother, uh, like my grandma, was a literature teacher, very rare for her, her generation in uh, Sichuan School of Arts. That was found, the school was founded by grandpa, um, who was a very famous uh, <laughs> Xichuan opera director uh, who used to own a theater in Chongqing. Um, so the school uh, offers a very little performing arts and folk music programs, such like dancing, Sichuan opera, drama, instrument, like earth and pipa, and folk music. She, at that time, also the uh, director of the school library. So I could access a lot of masterpieces uh, because the, the library was set up for the, uh, all the perform, performing arts programs in the school so that um, they could also have a lot of books that are generally a lot available in other places um, in the city. So I spent many summer months with my grandma in school library. Uh, for example, I read some of the books like William Shakespeare's uh, sort of uh, novels and dramas and the Russian novel, uh, the, the writer of the Leon Forestra and French writer uh, Victor Hugo. Um, so I, I read a lot of books and in summer times when I was with my grandma in the library. So of course I had a chance to meet a lot of the, some students in the school who later become very famous actors, actresses in China. So, so um, it was a very fun place to spend my, you know, uh, summer times and, and, you know, see those uh, uh, sort of the student in the school become famous actors, actresses you know, later on the TV stages. And so I was really something like very uh, 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 good memory about my so um, one thing that has impressed Jeff, uh, uh, greatly uh, was the, um, the, the my, my time with my mom for this sort of uh, a mobile medical visit. So I accompanied my mother for a few times for her mobile uh, medical visit. Uh, she uh, made one day short trips to see patients who are outside, who are outside workers out of the real company um, uh, uh, living uh, remotely from Chengdu, you know, and, and uh, having uneasy access to the company central hospital where my mom worked. I helped her carry all those, you know, these uh, medical so boxes on the trip. And over those trip, I, I saw like, um, property and lack of medical support system for workers and lack of education resource for kids and so on. At a very young age, I realized that relative good living condition given my parents should not be taken for granted. So that was very um, sort of uh, impressive sort of the um, things that in my early time in my life. So I moved, you know, 
go to middle school, 1976, uh, 1979 for three years, then two years high school. Um, so um, as a typical child, I had smooth middle school and high school education. Year uh, 1997 was the most important year of the sort of the modern Chinese history. That was the beginning of the modernization of Chinese uh, economy. Um, so, um, sort of the, uh, this transition from the government to plant economy to market uh, economy. That was the year when National University entrance exam, named Gaokao, probably heard this term, was returned after being suspended for 10 years. That was the year I entered middle school where I met my math teacher, who literally uh, shaped my career, uh, career uh, journey. Her name is Wang Ai Qin. So, so, so that, that this is the math teacher who had profound influence on my life. Uh, during the period of the two years, grades seven and eight, every day, teacher Wang gave me two to three math problems as extra homework problems, mostly algebra and uh, geometry problems with no interruption. So she graded every solution I submitted for free of charge. Uh, so over this two year period, I solved almost like 500 like math problems. And she did this, okay, I should say that. She did this for free of charge. And as a result of this training, my math skills becomes, uh, I, my, my math becomes the you know, strongest subject in the middle school and later in high school. This experience has had profound impact on my life and changed, my, changed me in many ways. So at the end of middle school, I already determined to become a teacher because of her. So uh, I want to be a teacher either in middle school or high school or university. I already made my decision at the time. I thought this is a profession that can change some people's life. So that, that's really something I feel that without her uh, sort of uh, uh, help, I would not be so, sort of, you know, have this kind of the uh, skills I could do, develop in my life. And, um, so that's why um, she had a lot of influence on my personal uh, career. And teacher Wang always encouraged me to find alternative solution to one problem. Sometimes um, she could not find new problems for me and she just challenged me to solve a old problem with different methods, mm -hmm. with different solutions. So this message has impacted me a lot. Um, in my career, I have done some work like this, for example, I studied quadratic inference function, in composite likelihood, and Hopla regression model as alternative solutions to GE and Randfax model. So this is really the training happened in, even in the early middle school uh, time. And most importantly, I even married a middle school math teacher. <laughs> so so that that's amazing. <laughs> So, um, high school, um, this was a, uh, there was a provincial exam um, at, as the, you know, at the end of the middle school. So top student may choose good, uh, may choose a good high school uh, according to the exam scores. So I participated in this type of exam twice at the uh, end of the grade seven and grade seven, uh, eight. So respectfully, at both times, I got the score that allowed me to enter the best high school in my city. Um, however, my parents had different ideas on this matter. They did, want, they did not want me to go uh, to live in a boarding school where uh, living conditions were not compared to those at home especially during the uh, pupil period, like. So they think that the girl health is much better than uh, going to a better school. Mm -hmm. So I end up this entering a local best high school near my home so that I can uh, still stay at home and have meals and 
all the uh, you know in Burmese school. So my high school, like grade nine and ten, during the nineteen seventy nine and nineteen eighty one, was a very boring period um, of two years. I already learned a lot of um, almost all high school math material in the middle school. So the high school math was not challenging at all to me. Um, plus, my high school physics teacher, physics teacher, was so bad that we sometimes <laughs> correct his arrows in his lectures. So I almost abandoned this subject. I, I, I wish there were other school curriculum that can fill in my curiosity and desire of learning more during my high school. But resources were very limited at that time. So, well, you have what you get. Yeah. So for many years, I was somewhat unhappy for my parents' uh, persuasion of choosing a local good high school instead of going to the best high school, which I could go um, with this sort of, as a boarding school. Later, when I become a parent, I understood that the best <laughs> advice to children is to live in a health growth environment, have a um, balanced life. So in this way, um, my career uh, journey uh, may last long and productive in long run, it avoid burning out, right? So, so that's basically that uh, some understanding I had later on. And, uh, but at that time I was say, how, why not? Right? I want to go to get a specialist school, right? So in 1981, I graduated from high school and, you know, wrote the Gaoka exam, this sort of college entrance exam. Every high school kid will, will, will you know, write that. With no surprise, I did did not I did, did well, um, and so um, uh, my math score was nearly the full score, which literally determined my career path on becoming a statistician. Okay, so in 1981, only about three percent of high school graduates can be uh, admitted to continue study in college, and about one percent of the high school graduates um, can enter so-called tier one university. I was lucky that my uh, Gaokao score was this the top one percentile, so I can enter the Department of Mathematics Jinning University in Changchun for my bachelor. So that's um, the four years, I mean, a university called Jinning University in Changchun. <clears throat> so Changchun is in the north, uh, eastern part of China is more like Boston. So if you think about Chengdu, more like uh, Houston, and Shanghai is more like uh, Miami, right? Or, or Baltimore. Changchun is more like uh, Boston. It's north, northeastern part of China. It's very cold, like very snowy in the winter. Um, but the, uh, the, uh, the, this is the, the university offers very good uh, mathematics mathematic programs in my time. So, um, and advised by several top Western uh, economists, uh, senior Chinese government officers realized that the talents in quantitative methods, statistical models and analysis of economic data are essential for the transition from planned economic, the economic to market economic in China. So in 1981, there were several universities chosen by the central government uh, have the first time launched the uh, bachelor degree of uh, you know, science specialized in statistics. And I was one of these 24 students who were selected or selected to enter the applied math major specialized statistics and department of mathematics at Jinning University. Not only me, who have never heard of statistics degree in math department, but also my professors at Jinning University had no idea how to run such a new program. <laughs> and it's totally new. I mean, I mean, it's like we need to do this because China is transitioning from plant economic to um, market economic. We need people who know statistic models and analyze economic <laughs> data, and nobody knows how to run this program. And it was really like the situation as said by Deng Xiaoping 
crossing the river while touching stones. So, um, so the uh, so I attended Jinning University in China in, in fall 1981. The Department of Mathematics offers the you know the the best uh, math education, one of the best math education programs in my time. We had a professor who graduated from Princeton, MIT, Cambridge, Wisconsin, as well as this professor had training in some Japanese universities and, and Russian universities. Um, our uh, university president, Dr. Tang, who got a PhD in chemistry from Cleveland University, implemented a very uh, sort of interesting uh, sort of uh, educate like a teaching model. He called this inverse ranking teaching model that basically allows us to submit outstanding professors. So how this works? So full professor will be assigned to teach first year undergraduate course. Mm -hmm. Associate professor would uh, assign to teach second year undergraduate student. This will never happen now nowadays because full professors are all very busy. But in my time, the full professor sort of the, 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 I mean, that was you know, assigned to teach first year undergraduate and so on and so forth. So they call this inverse rank teaching model. And because of the model, we are able to see a lot of famous, you know, <laughs> well established uh, outstanding professors uh, who taught us the introductory mathematics so that we benefit a lot okay, from that kind of model. So, um, So about the cost of education, during my uh, university years, university education was nearly fully free. We have no tuition, free uh, dorm room, shared, of course, shared apartment with your classmate, and that always a financial aid according to family income. So a good number of my classmates finished their study with no financial assistance from their family. Uh, more importantly, every university graduate was advocated job by the, the time of graduation. So you don't need to find a job. That, 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 I mean, after you are at the time of graduation, that you will be allocated a job. So in other words, having a, a ticket entering university means a, a guaranteed job at the graduation. So what we need to do really was just to study, okay? Not, nothing to worry and just study. So about the courses, as I said, nobody knew at that time how to run the, the program. And we were sort of like guinea pigs for a completely new uh, statistical DS program whose curriculum was still in the you know, trial stage. There were no suitable textbooks for the program. For example, our first course of probability theory in the second year used a PGD level probability theory book. Based on major theory, we, we, we start the first lecture on sigma algebra. We have no idea what it is. And then, then you know, uh, so a lot of the things like we just could not really understand because of that situation. And so, our first course of statistical estimation inference was based on lecture notes written by our teachers. And um, so, we were multivariate analysis uh, course follow closely to T.W. Anderson book of uh, introduction to multivariate statistical analysis. Our stochastic uh, process course followed very closely the Russian school of stochastic process and notations. So it's kind of a, sort of the um, uh, mix of a lot of things together. And so uh, we just, I think we just take, take whatever uh, available at that time. But we did have a programming course Fortune, uh, Fortune 77, but unfortunately we have um, we have zero hours practicing on computers. <laughs> so we learned the programming on a blackboard or a you know, handwriting on a piece of paper. At the total time that we got for uh, running code for an entire BS program was less than five hours. Well, that's the time, right? Like four, about 34 years ago. Indeed, we uh, basically learn theory, equations, formula, and some simple manual calculations like ANOVA. And uh, 
I feel that the BA education did not provide cohesive knowledge and experience on modeling and data analysis. Such concern largely drove me to pursue my education in master program. Um, so we were uh, the only corporate graduate from Department of Mathematics with a BS degree in statistics, 1985. The next corporate graduate, uh, one year later from the, uh, the same sort of the uh, statistical program as from school economics and management. As uh, our entire program moved uh, away from the Department of Mathematics to School of Economics Management in the university. Um, nevertheless, this pro program, um, as the program being originally designed, uh, with no price, uh, with no surprise, many of my classmates have their position in banks as well as um, researchers in economics and finance. I'm kind of all our who works in bank statistics because my mom is in medical science. So one course I enjoy the most is the practical course. Um, this is a very unique course for a, for a student in the math, math program. What, um, so, so that was the, uh, the course we enjoy a lot. We spent uh, like half semester, about two months, in a factory in Beijing to, pra to practice statistics. That was a, uh, I was in a group uh, of students that uh, involved in the uh, improving uh, procedures of, of quenching. Um, the, the, you know, quenching is this uh, softening uh, of the material in a high temperature above the uh, ray of crystallization phase that followed by a rapid cooling process to obtain certain like desirable material material properties uh, like durability against you know metal fatigue or something like that this is exactly the the, the quen quenching process that we a quen quenching process that you can see so that was very interesting practical work actually uh, with the uh, period of two months working with those uh, sort of workers in the in the workshop and see how we can use statistical knowledge to help them to design something better to improve the quality. So we designed experiments, multiple factors, such as temperature of heating uh, metal, configuration of the chemicals in solution, and duration of cooling in cold solution. So there are three factors we uh, set up different levels, and then we collect data, and then try to figure out what was the best combination of three factors that gives the, you know, uh, the, the, the best sort of duration, uh, durability, sorry. So this practice course motivated me to uh, take a course of quality of life in my first year of PhD at the UBC. That was quite a, so when I talked to Harry Jiu, who taught the course at the UBC, he said, why are you are taking this course? I said, because I have this practice course back in my bachelor. We have this ANOVA method to analyze this kind of quenching process, and I did not have fully understand. Uh, I do not have fully understand of you know quality control and so on. So really, that was uh, the motivation for me to take that PhD level course of quality life later on. So, so let, let me just move briefly to uh, my uh, seven years um, after my bachelor degree. So. In, um, so in 1985, I had a chance to enter the master program uh, at the University of Texas, Austin, through the help of my uncle, who was a visiting scholar at WE Department of University of Texas, Austin. But I did not take that offer, but decided to go uh, to continue my education in a master program in Southwestern Felton University in my hometown. So, SWJUT, JTU, I'm sorry, this is a typo, is in my hometown, Chengdu, is the, actually the leading research base for all engineering elements and research programs for the bullet train in China. So you see a lot of this sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, high speed train in, and sort of system in China, but the research started a long time ago. So that was the university who had a large responsibility for this current, like, 
um, high speed train um, sort of engineering in China. And at that, that time that we know that this university is doing a lot of research and has a lot of research programs related to this high speed train um, sort of engineering. So that, that was it's basically a, an interesting uh, sort of the experience. I took this uh, entrance exam and Academy of Science and decided to transfer to uh, SJTU. One reason was the student at the our program, master program, uh, would um, very likely to uh, be hired by university as faculty. So that uh, um, my parents said that why not we back, move back home and so you can be a faculty who can teach engineers and uh, you know and near home. You can say that clear this idea from my father. He wanted me to have a more involved in engineering rather than continue to uh, uh, sort of doing maths. So um, so anyway, that, that's basically the uh, uh, the uh, suggestion from my father to uh, move back home and uh, sort of join this uh, sort of the uh, master program that can help me basically uh, a faculty position at the university to teach engineers. Okay, that's what he wants. Okay. So um, I met another important teacher in my life, um, Professor Chai, who worked in the field of density, uh, kernel density estimation, especially large sample theory. So uh, in this, during this period of time, I studied several important books on asymptotic theory, such as William Stop almost surely convergence, Patrick uh, Belinsler uh, converted probably measure, and uh, Petrov's uh, sum of independent random variables. Of course, you know, we studied this Lehman's two books, um, point estimate test, testing hypothesis. So, so those books actually greatly improved my understanding of theory of theoretical statistics and analytical skills. So um, I began to understand and follow technical details in some papers published in the Annals of Statistics and Annals of Probability. Th these are two uh, journals available in our library. At that time, many important statistics journals like JASA, GRSB, Biometrica, Biometrics, Technometrics were not available in library. So we only have these two journals, Annals of Statistics and the Probability. So in order to write a master degree dissertation, we had to understand fully at least one paper uh, in one of those two journals. There's no other choice, okay? Uh, fortunately, there was one conjecture in empirical base that caught my attention. So basically that's my uh, dissertation topic. So this is called sync uh, conjecture in uh, uh, empirical base. So uh, Rahi uh, Singh uh, was a, a staff professor from University of Guelph who had this training, like PhD degree from uh, Michigan State University. And uh, he worked a lot on the, the theoretical part of the empirical base, published a uh, series of papers um, in, in, in analysis of statistics. There's two papers, 19, published in 1976 and 1979. Um, both hinted a conjecture, later uh, for, uh, formally formed as same conjecture that contain, uh, concerns the convergence rate of the empirical base estimation. So you can see that in the, in the bottom here, I, I sort of cut paste from the original uh, Anders paper, 1979 Anders paper. Basically, it says that, oh, we can prove this convergence rate near like uh, capital O n to the minus one. And others cannot do, uh, do this uh, sort of convergence rate. And so there's one conjecture, which means can we really uh, achieve exactly the order of capital N and minus one? Okay, what kind of conditions we need in order to get this exact rate of convergence? Okay, so that's basically the, the same conjecture. Okay, so that caught my attention um, during my. Uh, uh, master sort of uh, uh, period of time. 
So in my dissertation, I proved this uh, conjecture. And uh, so I proved that this rate is uh, achievable by Robin's linear empirical base estimator in their linear model. So the paper actually published here. So in the, the right corner. Okay. So um, multi-dimensional linear uh, empirical base estimation. At that time, we only published single author papers. No <laughs> advisor's name. <laughs> so just publish everything yourself. And, and very, very traditional, this, you know, uh, so the mathematical things. Right? So anyway, so after I submit this to my advisor, they did, they, he said, I cannot verify if this is right or wrong. Sounds like it's amazing that you can solve this conjecture, right? It doesn't, like, sounds too good to be true, right? So my dissertation has to be sent to uh, Acad Academia of Sciences and to, to they invite the experts to actually evaluate whether or not I prove the conjecture correctly. And so anyway, that finally gets published. And so I got my degree. So if I study a lot of this sort of uh, empirical base of theoretical problems, I uh, published other uh, papers, particularly like this one on the right top corner, where I already studied this non-parametric base using uh, derivative priors. Like at an age like 22, I already had a lot of this understanding of derivative priors and non-parametric statistics, a non-permanent base. So that's why I, 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 I was very, very basic at that time, and a little bit empirical basic, even on the start of my master's degree. But anyway, I think most, the most important training during this period of time is that I, I learned how to identify problems and solve them and publish solutions in the peer review journals. Um, those, those are very, very uh, good, valuable training for my uh, master's degree study. And, but I was not very satisfied with the type of mathematical research style. I wanted to do more applied work. Okay, so that basically motivated me to uh, continue my PhD study later on. But as you can see that, um, um, uh, as planned, after I got my master's degree, I uh, joined the Department of Applied Mathematics as a, a lecturer, sort of an inter-level faculty similar to the UK system. And SWJTU is a leading research base for all engineering departments, um, elements, I'm sorry, uh, so that I had a chance to uh, collaborate with faculties uh, from different engineering departments. During that time, I realized the importance of time series data analysis. And um, so um, just want to say a little bit about this university. Okay. So, um, the SWJTU uh, is one of the oldest uh, uh, universities in China, and um, its uh, its first president, Doctor uh, John Tianyu, was a, a PhD from Cornell. He actually designed and constructed the first railway in Qin Dynasty from Beijing to Zhangjiakou. So. Um, According to my father, this is one of the most important engineering universities in China. And he encouraged me to become a faculty member and teach, uh, you know, future railway engineers of China in the university. I got an offer from Tsinghua University at the time I graduated for my master to be a faculty then. But my father wanted me to stay here and really do the uh, uh, sort of the uh, be faculty there. Okay. So working with the faculty in different engineers department, I realized time series is something that's really an important topic. Many data collected from engineering projects by sensors or monitors on fast moving trains were time series data. There was a, this is a subject I never learned in my BS, bachelor or master programs. Um, it was my strong desire to systemat systematically learn statistical method and application for time series data. This largely motivated me to work on my PhD dissertation on longitudinal data analysis. <laughs> Basically, this type of data consisting of many uh, short time series and state space model for long time series. So, this choice of research area and preparation put me 
in a good position to work on like COVID-19 infectious data, uh, uh, time series data last year. So there was a long story back even as a faculty in the 1988, I started to work with those engineering professors that they have the data from train, moving trains and all time series. I say, how do you analyze that? I've never learned how to analyze this type of data. So, so that's why I have a sort of this uh, desire to learn how to do this, uh, this type of data analysis. So after being a faculty in this uh, SWGTU for five years, I continued my journey as a PhD student at UBC in Vancouver. So um, in the fall 1982, I flew to Vancouver to begin my PhD in the Department of Statistics. Vancouver, you know, is a very beautiful city and I feel very lucky to live there for four years in my life. Um, the reason I choose to uh, choose UBC for my PhD was that originally I planned to work with Nancy Hickman, who uh, graduated from uh, UM Stat Department, uh, was a student of Michael Woodrow. And my um, uh, master degree uh, advisor told me that uh, Nancy Hickman is, is working in this very important field of smoothing spline um, in non-parametric regression. So, but apparently I did not uh, listen very carefully to my dissertation, master dissertation advisor. I ended up, ended up, ended up with working with Ben Jorgensen. Um, so um, Ben uh, is a GRM guy, was a student um, uh, of only uh, Bundle of Nelson and Jared Cox. And the, the, the reason that I, I decided to work with Ben was because his theory of dispersed model that attracted me to work with him. That work was published as a discussion paper in 1987 in GRSSB. So here is a little bit math. I'm sorry for this. Yeah. And so, so, you know, you learn 651, right? So this GRM, you have this natural family distribution as error distribution of, of you know, GRM, but Ben uh, had different ideas to how to formulate this uh, uh, error distribution or random components for a uh, generalized medium model. So he said that, well, there's normal distribution where Y is your data and mu is your uh, parameter of interest on which you want to specify your uh, model as a function of your covariance then you want to uh, measure the goodness of fit by the like your clip distance between Y and the observed data and your model, right? And you have, you know, a probability distribution to describe the chance of this uh, uh, randomness of your, or, of your data. So then he said, well, why not if we extend this model, uh, this uh, specification in this way, where this uh, your clean distance uh, between your data and your model can be described as, as a general distance function t, which is, measures the uh, uh, you know the data you observe and the model you pr propose. So the d is deviance, right? So this uh, is very famous uh, me metric that you know in the GRM, and he is able to construct this very very uh, uh, interesting extension from normal model to this uh, a class of uh, uh, generalized linear models. That to me is very intuitive, very interpretable, because what you really want here is really find a distribution that can somehow quantify this goodness of fit. And the way to quantify a, a goodness of fit outside normality is the deviance function. So he proved that this structure can contain normal gamma inverse Gaussian stable distributions that are quite widely used in the uh, climate change, or, you know, the extreme value uh, field and compound plus one, this is distribution can come up, uh, inflate a zero sort of uh, 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 distribution. And by this continuous, and you can have a, a discrete a distribution of binomial plus one negative binomial, not only those uh, distribution we know, but also it contains this for Mises distribution for annual data, if you study the directional wind, it can also be written in this form. And also another 
uh, important distribution called simplex distribution, which is very is a, is a, a distribution for proportional data, very, very similar to beta distribution. So this uh, formulation, I feel that is magic that mm -hmm. can contain a lot of distributions and very easy with easy understanding why this distribution is constructed, what are the, the parameters and what are the, you know, uh, the metric that we're supposed to use to quantify the, uh, the modeling um, quality and so on. So this is, I think it's very genius work to me, and this is a paper, the work for published in the GRCP as a single author discussion paper. I think that was, after I read the paper, I just decided to work with them. And so, uh, Anyway, so so in the uh, uh, let me see at the end of the first year PhD study, June 1993 turned out to be a turning point of my career path. I attended the SS, SSC annual meeting in Acadia University, Nova Scotia, where I registered a short course in longitudinal data analysis, the GE call talk by Lee and, and Ziegler. And Scalzer and Queen uh, them. This turned out to be a big course on, of my career because one day short course totally confused me. And I didn't understand GE at all. And, and but I decided to figure it out. So my journey of searching for understanding of GE contributed the first part of my PhD dissertation. So rather than deciding, rather than deciding uh, now study the subject where I get the, you know, the confusion and some, some difficulty I try, try to figure it out and, and write my first part of my dissertation uh, uh, based on, uh, you know, some, you know, some research that I do for my dissertation. Okay. <clears throat> so basically I asked the three very fundamental questions that really confused me. So first question is that G is estimated function. So what is the uh, cost of likelihood counterpart of G? So in GRM, right, you can have over dispersion, you start with estimated function, you can always find a cost of likelihood function as an object function. So what is the object function corresponding to uh, G? That's the first question I was trying to figure out. The second question is something about because GE claims that even if you use working correlation, you can improve estimation efficiency. My question here is what is the upper bound um, that the efficiency improvement by GE cannot exceed? What, what, what is the maximum improvement GE can achieve? You can improve it, but how much and what is the limit of this improvement? That's the second question I want to ask. So the third one will say that. Um, how much improvement of efficiency is sufficient? Okay, so that's those like three questions that sort of motivate me to write the PhD dissertation. And particularly uh, for the second question, where I was trying to find a sort of upper bound sort of a solution to uh, examine how much, uh, what's the, you know, the so upper bound that GE can accept. Uh, in, in terms of efficiency. I, in 1994, I uh, proposed this sort of uh, multivariate copula regression model. That turns out to be one of the highly cited papers uh, in my career. What I was trying to do here is that I want to sort of why follows a, let's say, gamma distribution is not normal distributed. I do this sort of transfor transformation make this uh, to be a uniform distributed and then do quantum transformation for normal and I transform it to normal. Then I put those M marginal normal variables into more very normal so that I can have this dependent structure and, and from inherent from normal distribution. Okay, nowadays this transformation is now new. In 1994, I mean, this is something like quite a, uh, I feel that it's quite a nice construction. I, I, nowadays in genetics, people call this inverse normal transformation. Um, but at my time, I already noticed like 20 years ago that this transformation is very nice transformation that allow you to put marginal things into a multivariate things that you can uh, construct a multivariate distribution 
so you remove very regression model. Okay, so this one allows me to uh, study what, what is the you know the upper bound of efficiency and how much gap that GE versus this type of the uh, cultural based regression model you would have. Okay, so that you know uh, uh, is very uh, sort of the uh, uh, interesting work I did in my PhD. Okay, so how much time? So it's 4.35 now, so maybe can... Can we have two minutes? Yeah. Okay, sure, thank you. So now moving on to this, uh, the, the faculty life, right? So so I um, had this uh, chance to join the... Okay, I, I should first tell you a, a secret that at the time I, I, I 1996, I, I graduated and um, so Jack Kalfish and Jerry Lawless offered me a postdoc position, but I did not take it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, the secret. I decided to take a tenure track position <laughs> at the York University of Toronto. Um, so, um, so one of the uh, uh, there's a few things that you might. Uh, years at, at the faculty at York University. First of all, I met my uh, sort of long-term collaborator, Annie Chu. She is uh, the professor in the user urban now, and we started to collaborate for uh, uh, many years. And uh, that was a very uh, important sort of the uh, collaboration I established at a very uh, junior year. And at the time, my uh, Dissertation on advisor Ben Jorgensen moved back to Denmark. And I feel quite lonely at one, you know, at a conference in 1998. Annie and I gave a presentation in the same session. She was talking about uh, providing inference function. I was talking about cupola. And we immediately noticed that we are all interested in, you know, modeling of repeat measurements and have a different ideas how to do this stuff. Then we started to collaborate uh, for many years. And another thing I should mention that is really, you know, I, I'm very proud that I got this teaching award from Faculty of Arts. So, so you need, in, in, in the Faculty of Arts, you work in university, you have, you know, programs like psychology, social sciences, history, political science, and so on. And I'm a, a math teacher, a statistician, uh, and there's an English, like speaking English with accents and so on and so forth. I just don't know, like, for this boring, those all boring courses, statistics, how could I get this award? I mean, students nominated me. I, I was so happy that I got that uh, teaching award. Right? So I did spend a lot of time as kind of reactive to my, the figure that my middle school teacher did to me. I, I sort of, to some, in some spirit, I want to pay back to, uh, you know, so, so provide my service to students so that hopefully, we can get some good training or some good advice or some good, good courses I, I taught there. And so, but this is something where I, I enjoy so much as this uh, <laughs> teaching over. And of course, I, I said back in 2002, 2003, at the last at the time here at the University of Michigan. This literally changed my life, right? So, particularly that um, at the end of this sabbatical leave, my wife told me that that's the city we're going to leave. <laughs> so I listened to my boss anyway. So so that, that so 2004, I moved to uh, uh, Department of Statistics and Actual Science, uh, University of Waterloo. And of course, this is the best that department in Canada. And we have a lot of the outstanding colleagues in, in the department. And, so, um, and, and um, I was very honored to be a colleague with Professor Godami, that uh, who developed the you know Godami information as you know of which Fisher information special case because I was working on a lot of estimation equation and inference function and Godami information is very essential you know the uh, uh, information matrix we call sandwich form and so but I. Told all my students, including Pei Song, <laughs> we, we need to call 
We should not call sandwich estimator. We should call that information because he is the person who first discovered the sandwich for, for this asymptotic covariance matrix uh, in, in the estimating function. Uh, something outside of the likelihood. So, so um, yeah. So I have a chance to uh, have interaction with applied mass optimization people in the faculty of mathematics. That motivated me a lot to think about uh, how we can sort of uh, integrate the power of uh, optimization into statistics. And so, of course, that I work out uh, work on this uh, book project. And so this uh, this book um, uh, published by Springer in two thousand seven. Okay. So that's uh, really something I uh, work quite a bit and work And now back to sort of the modern time and my GPA somehow now works and come to guide me to uh, this department. So I joined the department in January 2008. I've been here like for uh, almost 14 years. And um, so, uh, most of the back, uh, the colleagues know me, and how do I like this department? Well, you know, this is the place one could work on normal applications. I had, I have dreamed to do since I was an undergraduate student. So, this is the uh, place I feel that that fulfill my uh, satisfaction, and I really want to work applied statistics. And my early time, because of lack of resources and uh, and and situations I did not get many chances to work on apply from. Now, probably is too many, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and the place I can, one can be super smart and super motivated students. Like I've uh, analyzed 17 PhD students here and they're all very, very motivated, very, very smart students here. That part I enjoy so much too. I mean, working with them. And the place where one would never worry about being the smartest person in the room. And uh, Confucius said that if you are the smartest person in the room, you must be in the wrong room. So that um, I feel that this, you know, always have good advice from your colleagues and even from students. And, and it's really something you have this intellectual exchange with uh, people around you. And I, I feel that this is really a big plus to work in the department. And of course, we have so many meetings, and uh, we can have some meeting uh, in one year or so. I mean, just too many meetings. And uh, so uh, I wish we can reduce that. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and of course, this is a place that we're all constantly reminded by a strong spirit of collaboration. You know? So that's something I really think is very important. And so, after I moved to Michigan, I worked on a lot of some new problems like, like data integration, spatial statistics, distributed inference, high dimension statistics, and recently in fashion disease model. So, um, yeah, so uh, there are a lot of challenging problems, interesting problems uh, naturally arising from uh, applied projects that we just cannot stop thinking <laughs> a lot of the new things and be, you know, uh, eager to. Work on a lot of new things, and so, and of course, I do a lot of collaborations and like um, kidney pair donation program. I work a lot with Jack Coffish, nephrology, uh, environmental science, nutrition science, asthma, chronic disease management, and wearable devices. I collaborate with a lot of people in the department, uh, in the school, at the university. So that's really a very uh, enjoyed time in the past fourteen years. So recently, I'm writing a, a review paper. It's called Seven Perspective of Distributed Inference. I'm trying to review uh, seven different methods um, that have been sort of developed to do this sort of uh, data integration or distributed inference, like from ML, image analysis, judicial, confidence distribution, generalized method moment, base, posterior, and empirical likelihood. So I found actually a very interesting thing that. So the fidelity inference and confidence distribution and uh, GMM that are proposed by three, uh, you know, very, very uh, smart people like Fisher, Ephraim, and Hansen uh, across like, like almost like 50 years. 
but they come up actually it's same kind of principle ways of data integration. I really enjoy this kind of this thought that um, this those the, the, the ideas or method proposed by people across you know very wide spectrum of time and end up is very similar solutions. How people can really um, have this kind of uh, uh, powerful thought and idea and that. I, I think that really motivated me to think more what are the um, sort of the uh, good um, approaches in an uh, interest uh, to So the last slide, in terms of hobbies, and again mentioned that I, I have a lot of hobbies, right? So I like travel and also I'd like to talk to my students. We have gatherings and of course I like classical music. I still practice violin. I mean, I'm in my basement. <laughs> and I, I like to sing and in karaoke, like it. And so, not that as the, you know, the very uh, formal sort of the performance, uh, but enjoy that. And badminton, certainly. And nowadays, during the pandemic, I do jogging and pranking. So, my record is um, 12 minutes. Oh, no, no, 20 minutes. I do the pranking 12 minutes per day. Every day, I do pranking 12 minutes. But my record is 20 minutes. Anybody who breaks this record, let me know. <laughs> and I, I I learned Tai Chi in the past year, and uh, so now I can just pick up the acrylic printing and and home. So I sometimes I if I need a little bit rest, I just start you know uh, randomly <laughs> uh, color on, on the. Uh, and so, um, so I enjoy the, the, that little silent moment. Uh, and uh, so, thank you all for uh, listening to my talk. And go do have a wonderful. a moment to invite Peter's students who are here to come up here. And postdocs. So direct, they direct mentees. And I know that many of them are faculty members here, so they're still a student. So I think that, you know, as um, as you see, like you know, Peter's work has really left a strong imprint in the department. But also, I think two words, two Ks beyond the kun that he explained summarizes Peter is kindness and knowledge. So you can see the effort of all of that. And so, thank you so much, Peter. So, Margaret, on behalf of the students, is going to present the certificate, which I think is a very important award in this department. <laughs> Sarah, I need a bigger office to have. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the time to negotiate. <laughs> so, and also, like, you know, as I know that the only thing which works on faculty is chocolate and alcohol. So, uh, so I am going to give Peter a bottle of wine to enjoy over the holidays. And let us take this beautiful moment uh, outside with food. If there are any burning questions, then uh, I can. Oh, if you have anything to say about Peter, please share. Uh, and if you have any questions, but I just wanted to do this, and then um, we'll take the party outside and get some food. But yeah, if you wanted to share something, Margaret, you're welcome. To sure. Um, I <laughs> Bernard caught me in the elevator on the way down here, and I'm, I'm so glad I always take stairs, unlike uh, Peter, uh, who always seems to be taking the stairs. Um, I've been Peter's student for an undisclosed number of years so far, <laughs> and um, me and my fellow students feel so lucky to work with him. Uh, he's a, a great mentor, and he's always generous with his time and his uh, insights and his energy. Um, whether we're going on lab hikes and he's telling us about his 10 minute plants, which is terrible here, <laughs> uh, or he's organizing lab meetings and encouraging us to discuss and share our ideas with each other. Uh, he's just uh, an inspiring mentor and we feel so lucky to work with him. So 
Thanks, Peter. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions for Peter? Yes, please. Any so high school is two years? Yes. So My time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now they have a, they're now high school is three years. Um, my time that uh, they we need a lot of uh, workforces to get into the market so that we only have 10 years, like five years uh, uh, elementary, three years middle school, and two years high school. So I got my uh, bachelor's degree at age 20 and master like 22, then I become faculty and teach the student who was almost the same age. <laughs> I, I, I think that the first lecture, I still remember that. I, I give the uh, uh, introduction to statistics to the second year of the students in the computer science department. Like 150 students in the room, I was like 22 or 23 year old. That, uh, you know, managing this huge class, and I was very fun to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had uh, 10 years in, from elementary to high school in my time. Any other questions? I'll work on that big office. <laughs> and, and now, fortunately, there is a lot of opportunity because people are not coming to office. So, uh, so and, I can't uh, have this. <laughs> but thank you, everyone, for coming together this afternoon. It has been a long time since I've seen so many people in this room. And uh, we'll pick up and take the party outside. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.